like to, um, as time is rushing on, to see if people have any uh, questions they want to answer, uh, ask uh, the panelists, uh, particularly focused on climate change um, and, and the equity aspects, um, but we, we would be willing to tolerate others as well. Yes, Anna, Tony. Uh, Portuguese yes. or English? Portuguese. No, Portuguese. Okay. É, primeiro, muito obrigado. Minha pergunta é se vocês sabem se em algum dos países de vocês a contribuição nacional que todos os países agora estão colocando é, para a conferência que vai ter final em Paris, se nas contribuições nacionais falam sobre cidades, se tem metas para a cidade, tanto para adaptação, para mitigação, se tem metas específicas para cidades. Uh, does does someone, want to, oh, someone want to take that, or I could, no. or we could ask? Um... No Brasil, eu posso responder. Quando a gente não atingir a meta, a gente dobra a meta. <laughs> could, could you repeat that? We didn't get the. <laughs> it's. Uh, it's an internal, complicated issue. <laughs> because it's a famous saying from our president. She said, if you cannot achieve a meta or a, a goal, so you should double the goal. I, I don't know what she intended to say. <laughs> no. Nobody in this country knows, <laughs> but in some way it's interesting. <laughs> uh, okay, thank, thank you. Um, it can be good. Would you, would you like to say a word? Hello. Okay. No, I'd just like to go back again to the last issue because I think it's very important. For example, we need to achieve quality of life because sometimes we begin to work in a caricature. For example, Bogotá this time has exact same population as London. Same. And London has four and a half times the area of Bogotá. And London is not Houston. I mean, London, everybody thinks it's a compact city, probably transfer, so. But then so, when we begin, it begins like a cliche, density, density, density. But London has, for example, every boy in Bogotá and most girls play Football, football. London has more than 1,500 public football fields. Bogota has 60. I prefer to be less compact and to have 1,500 football fields. For children, for less crime, for more happiness, for more social integration. So, who, who, watch out. Now, don't become too historical about some things. Just, uh, I think we want to achieve a city where people are happy where we have great quality of life, because sometimes, it's not your case here, but I just say in Colombia, sometimes it becomes the obsession and about density, density. No, we need to have as much density as possible, but we have to have a city where people are happy, where we have spaces, where we have big sidewalks, parks, and sometimes even if that means less density. I would much rather have a little less density and have all those football fields. Well, I agree with you. <laughs> It's well said, and I, I, I do agree with you. Sometimes we tend to get a little too obsessed by the, by the density issue. Um, just, uh, just picking up, Anna Tony, so, I, I, so, so, the, so the way the Paris thing is working, and I, I know you're working on it, so you don't need me to tell you this, but um, uh, I mean, we, we pretty much know the country offers are going to be good, but nowhere near enough. They'll get us to probably less than half of where we need to get to by 2025 to get onto the right path, two degrees. And so the really clever thing that UNFCCC and the, and the French government and Mayor Bloomberg and the C40 and Italy and these guys have done is they've said, look, let's have a, let's have a series of, um, of coalitions. And cities is just one of them, but it's probably the biggest. And, and the coalition is going to get the, get the leading cities that are willing to say, we're going to step up, whether or not our country has been as ambitious as it might. We're going to go the extra mile. We are going to... We're going to pledge more, 
And the idea is you create this virtuous cycle of, uh, of positive sort of teamwork and competition and, and clubs. And it's not just cities. I mean, there's one on landscape restoration. There's one on energy efficiency and so on. So it's, I, I think it's quite an exciting time. But it, it's, really, it's really wonderful to see the way that some cities... And if there are mayors here that, that haven't decided if they want to be part of this, I mean, I really would encourage you to talk to the people here that are... Are, uh, are, are part of it. Mayor Lasserde has left, but everyone here sort of is very familiar with this. Any other questions or comments? Yes, back there. Meu nome é Oswaldo Lima Neto. Sou secretário de Transporte e Trânsito de Olinda, de Pernambuco, Nordeste do Brasil. Estou falando mais como cidadão urbano no Brasil. Apesar dessa discussão toda aqui, eu não sinto essa questão é, climática na pauta e na preocupação tanto dos cidadãos como dos governantes, na maioria do país. Não há, ela não toca. Existem questões muito mais agudas que encobrem essa. E não se sabe, é, é, vamos dizer assim, motivar essa mudança. E a minha pergunta vai... O que fazer para mudar? Porque eu não sinto essa preocupação, apesar do mundo todo, se fala, se fala muito, se faz quase nada. Eu, mesmo, bom, eu vou, vou responder. Ah, é óbvio que as pessoas não estão na rua marchando. Vamos evitar... É, como os grandes, ninguém faz panelaço a favor é, do, da redução de emissões de carbono e tudo. Mas, em relação à qualidade da vida, de vida, a resposta acontece. Se uma cidade resolve bem o seu problema de mobilidade, ela está ajudando o problema do câmbio climático. Se uma cidade está resolvendo bem o seu problema é, de, é, de uso do solo, ou está resolvendo bem o problema na área social, então nós temos soluções de equidade que podem e, ao mesmo tempo, ajudam no problema do, da discussão do, 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 do câmbio climático. É, todas as vezes que me perguntam como é que você faz uma grande transformação social na sua cidade, eu digo, bom, se não conseguir nessa geração, eu tenho que garantir a próxima geração. Então, eu vou dar um exemplo com a minha cidade. Nós tínhamos é, índices de qualidade de vida, não só em relação ao transporte, na área da educação, mais de 130 centros de saúde, independente de hospitais, mais de 280 creches gratuitas que se destinam à população. Onde é que isso vai chegar? Nós temos um índice de migração muito grande, tínhamos no nosso estado. Então, a, a resposta era... A, Próxima geração, ela já aconteceria integrada através das creches, das boas escolas, da, da área de saúde. Então, isso acontece naturalmente. Em relação a transporte, é, é, água, o, 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 o problema é, da poluição dos nossos rios, tudo isso ajuda... Não é? Oh, veja, nós tínhamos uma política de eh, evitar o problema maior, a, contami a contaminação dos rios. Como? Tratando 
pelo menos até chegar ao, ao principal, quer dizer, nunca deixando aumentar o problema. Nós não, não fazíamos, engessávamos rios para que eles corressem mais rápidos e aí mais inundações. E assim nós não fazíamos é, moradias muito importante, é, separadas, é, guetos de gente muito rica ou gente muito pobre. A grande característica de Curitiba, de todas as habitações, era a vizinhança diversificada. Quer dizer, não é só uma faixa de renda, é ocupando a malha urbana com as diferentes faixas de renda para que essa diversidade acontecesse e acontecesse uma coexistência maior. Então, eu não vou cansá-los com dados, mas eu quero dizer, o esforço que uma cidade faz no sentido de resolver uma melhor qualidade de vida, ela repercute em todas as outras coisas. Então, Talvez o povo não esteja marchando é, com essa... Mas as coisas estão acontecendo, se a cidade está tomando as decisões corretas nesse sentido. Então, nós, eu acho que nenhuma cidade é, pode se afastar do problema da sua gente é, não é necessário se afastar do problema da sua gente, a gente se preocupar também com uh, problemas que afetam a toda a humanidade. Eu sempre digo, é, três problemas são essenciais às cidades, não só à sua cidade, mas para toda a humanidade. Mobilidade, a sustentabilidade, que é decorrente também disso, e a sociodiversidade. Ou seja, você, a convivência de todas, de todos, é, a, a diversidade de todas as faixas de renda, não separar as pessoas. E, e isso ajuda a coexistência. Então, é, talvez essa não seja uma preocupação, mas indiretamente está se atendendo a isso. Great, thank you. Mary Jane, you just a brief yes, comment. Yes, Andrew, I just wanted to say, and um, Mayor Lerner ended with that, that we have only one world. You probably don't feel the effects of climate change here in Brazil, and I'd like to congratulate you, and you should be thankful for those blessings. But if you live in the Philippines or in Asia, and you feel a typhoon or a hurricane, and when you see 10,000 people killed because of this typhoon, in fact, there was one time I had a visitor, a foreigner, and we had a typhoon. And you know what he told me? He said, Mary Jane, whenever I read the newspapers and hear that you had a typhoon, I will treat that with respect. Because when they say we'll have a thunderstorm, for example, here in Brazil yesterday, it, wasn't, it was nothing compared to the thunderstorms we have in the Philippines. The thunder there is now stronger. Lightning is even brighter. And have you seen horizontal rain? That is how it comes down. We have horizontal rain. So probably if media can always come up with these things happening in the third world, like in Asia, when we have these typhoons, then you will be thankful and you will then say, I would like to do my share. It may be a small one, but it will help save a life somewhere in this world. So with that, I guess climate change would be in there. Great. Well done. Thank you very much. Do we, um, we could maybe take a couple more questions. Um, time is rushing on. I know that, uh, Sam, you wanted to, you had a, a comment on this. Yeah, just to add uh, to those great comments, one of the first things I did after getting elected mayor was to merge the Office of Sustainability, so the sustainability program, 
which most cities in the United States have, with the Department of Planning, the Bureau of Planning. Merge them together and put the Director of Sustainability in charge of the new, we call them Bureau or Department of Planning and Sustainability. And that, then, that was the core staff group that we then worked with those other 26 jurisdictions and went out for 41 town halls with our community to put together the Portland Plan, which is our holistic strategic plan. And one of the key deep implementations of that was our climate action plan that we did at the same time as our economic development strategy. So that the two, we, we forced ourselves to sort of talk about how do we address climate change with smart climate action, but also seek to become pros more prosperous, more equitably prosperous along the way. Did we achieve it all? No, the work is still underway, a lot more work to do. But having that, having those two operations, sustainability and planning combined, mean, meant that more of every decision had wired into its DNA sustainability thinking. Because I can't be in the room every day as mayor in every room, but that, those people can be, and everything had to pass through that, that department. Thank you very much. Was there another question? I can't see you up there. Um, I've got one, and then we'll, we'll bring this to a close very shortly. Here, here's one here. It's not particularly related to climate change, but it's very relevant to it. Um, it's well known that any change process that's supported by popular participation is more likely to succeed and is more lasting. However, it's also harder to implement. How do you treat this issue? How do you make that call? Because some of you, all of you, I'm sure will claim that you really sought the participation of your citizens at the same time, some of you made tough decisions that, quite frankly, had you asked everyone to vote on, you wouldn't have got it through. And I mean, I know that applies to you again. <laughs> Later on, they would. So uh, any, anyone want to just share a brief experience on that? Well, the simple reality is that if you're a mayor, your job is to lead. And it's important to carry the public with you. But it's your job to be looking at the data, the forecasting, and come up with the strategy. It isn't going to come out of a general, vague consultation. We had a lot of consultation and debate about the ideas we floated, but I came into politics to actually change things, I and mean, not to wait until there was a consensus about what we should do. If you're elected to a position, whether it's prime minister or mayor or governor, your job is to educate and lead because the average person hasn't got the time to look at all the economic data, the scientific data, and so on. And therefore, I think there's this balance. Carry the public with you, but you need to know where you're going. And I went into my first mayor election in 2000 promising to introduce um, the congestion charge and promising to abolish all restrictions on height and density in new buildings. Once I'd won the election, then we had debates with all the various interested groups about how to carry that forward. But I'd won the election on those bold commitments. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Enrique. Yes. Uh, new ideas are never born with a majority support. And uh, Sometimes when you're doing new things, it's very difficult. When we're talking about uh, bikeways, it was something crazy. And if I had, I mean, many of the things we did, which are now the reasons why I am invited here, if I had asked the people, they would have voted no. Uh, besides, uh, the people who are affected tend to be very vocal and vociferous. Uh, even though they may be a small mi mi minority, and the majority who would, would benefit, they will not support you. For example, when you get tens of thousands of cars off the sidewalks, the upper income people are so powerful, they are even able, they, are, they convince, they have the television, they have all the power, and they are able to convince the poor people that this is bad for them. For example, once I was in the poorest neighborhoods in Bogota, and one of the people in my team asked, this little 10-year-old girl, do you like the mayor? And then she says, no. And then my person says, why? And then she says, because of the bollards, you know? Because we put a lot of bollards to keep cars from parking on the sidewalks. 
And of course, this girl never in her life probably had been in a private car, never. She was the most benefited by this, but then the power of the powerful people in a society is so huge that they can even convince the poor people that what is made for their benefit is bad. So, you have to try, we try to do as much participation as possible. We did, for example, 700 small community projects which were proposed by the community, organized community and contracted with them. As I mentioned before, we, we went and we had the people vote on a car-free day. On the car-free day is the people voted themselves. But there are many, many ways, especially new projects, new ideas, new concepts. For example, when we did, we did, as I mentioned, we did like 70 kilometers of bicycle highway, sometimes through neighborhoods which had no pavement in the streets. And if I had asked the people, do you want this or do you want the streets paved? Even though 99% of the people in those neighborhoods don't have a car or even a, that, not even a motorcycle. So, of course, ideally we should persuade them and we should work, but we don't have enough time and we have three year period at that time. So, what I'm trying to say, sometimes, we, I mean, in general, we have to try to get as much participation as possible, to avoid conflict as much as possible, but in the end, especially new things, will require a, go a person in government who just does not want to be the sympathy queen, will require to make unpopular decisions, painful decisions, costly decisions. I mean, they were so costly in my case. I was, at one point, I had 85% negative image. Uh, I even had to send my daughter to live in Canada with uh, my brother, my 11-year-old daughter, because it was very painful. It's very funny to talk here, but it's not so easy to live it. And when I had to, when I finished my term happily, I had the highest positive image a mayor had ever had in Bogota, but the, it was the pro, if I had just tried to be nice, I would have not achieved 90% uh, of the things that I think were important. Wow. That's yeah. fantastic, uh, thank you. There is a saying from a very wise scientist who said once, tendency is not a destiny. It was René Dubois who said that. That means at the, ex the exact moment when you detect a bad tendency is the exact moment of change. So every time when you're against a tendency or a trend, it's, it's difficult. So and democracy is not consensus. It's a conflict, but a, process, a conflict, process of conflict are very wisely arbitrated. It has to be this. So, I remember when we started uh, to work with the garbage, and I, I started buying the garbage and the people, they thought I, I was crazy because I'm, I started to buy garbage because they were throwing away the garbage in the bottom valleys or in the hills where there were not trucks to collect them. So the kids used to play and to, on, on polluted areas. And we started to buy as long as they brought their bags uh, close to the, 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 collect, the collecting tracks. So, and, that, and we pay them, not by money, but transport tokens. And in three months, it was clean. And they had uh, an additional income. So, little by little, sometimes, I remember, when we started to, uh, when I wa was a governor, we started, we, we had to start to clean our base. So we didn't have money from the World Bank, 800 million dollars. 
So, and the question was not wo public works, it was the mentality. So we started a deal with the fishermen in if the fishermen they catch the fish, it belongs to them. If uh, the day was not good for fishing, they went to fish garbage and we bought the garbage. So the more garbage they had, the cleaner the bay become. It was a win-win solution. So every time when you have to work against the trend and against a tendency, it's a very difficult. But there are some ways a demonstration effect. You start with a line of public transport. Just how to demonstrate how it could work. In my city, when we started the program, program of separating garbage, so every child, they knew how much, how much trees the recycling paper could save. They knew all the numbers, and they were in placards in all the parks they could follow and they could see what is the effect of a decision. So it's, I, I would say, working with the communities is never, it's never uh, bringing buses with people, just an assembly. You have to start with a proposal. And the way the people, they answer, you can change. It's like a trajectory where uh, you have to leave room to people that correct you if you are not in the right track. So Thank you. it's amazing how far you can go. Uh, it's not just saying we have to give uh, everyone, we have to have agreement of everyone is difficult, but little by little you can make uh, some uh, good efforts. Okay, thank you. We, we have to bring this to a close very quickly. I've just got a... I like one small comment. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, you could answer this final question and then after this um, I'm going to ask Tony Lindau to come up because he's been listening very carefully this afternoon and one of the values of this afternoon is that we and everyone in this room gets great ideas. And since Tony is leading um, forward the WRI Embark work here and trying to be helpful to many cities, it, I, I thought it'd be just interesting to hear what he takes away from this. Uh, a mayor in the room has just asked this question, and, and this would be a much too big a question to answer in detail. Um, do you have any insights on funding? Um, on funding. The specific question is wh where do you get the money for your projects? And I, I, I think that's too big a question for you all to answer. But I know some of you say borrow, some of you say don't borrow. Um, it, it just just um, it, it, any insights on that simply because I want to honour this question. Um, Can I just say when I was mayor we needed to upgrade our transport system to have a credible bid for the Olympics. I was given permission by the the Labour government to go to the bond markets to borrow. We wanted three billion pounds. We could have got 12 billion. I, and therefore, if you've got a credible project that looks like it's going to work, people all over the world are desperate to invest in secure um, projects. So Ken is a pretty extreme version of if you build it, they will come. In other words, <laughs> find the money, spend it, and it will earn for itself. But not everyone agrees with him. <laughs> uh, Sam. It's too hard. The, the status quo, is, it's too hard for cities, for certain kinds of businesses to get the funding they need to make the transformation. Um, even when you can show through, other, through others' efforts or piloting efforts 
that it's a, it will be a going concern, whether it's a government operations, it'll collect enough resources or have enough benefits. And so that's why, you know, having mayors gather together and identify collective problems like lack of access to financing for green and sustainable projects, uh, it's just too hard. And your involvement here today, uh, hopefully involvement in things like the compact and other sort of global efforts are so important because it's, it's in mass mayors and cities can demand and get better financing for more sustainable projects. And all of you, I assume, would support more tax raising powers to cities, would you? You'd like to see some fiscal uh, responsibility shifted to the cities, would you? Well, the thing is that many of the taxes that we can charge need to be charged to the whole country. Because, for example, surcharge tax to fuel. We were able to achieve a surcharge tax to fuel in Bogota initially, but then if the other municipalities around don't have it, the people just go get the gasoline next door. So we need a national law in many cases. And we need to, it, sometimes it can get, get crazy because in some municipalities where there are upper income people who, and there are some other municipalities very near where there are low income people. The upper income people can pay a lot, but they don't use any, any government services. They don't go to public schools, they don't go to public health, they don't go, and so. Sometimes they can lower taxes much more and attract, so. But I'd like to say one thing. Uh, for funding. Ideally, since we are talking about mobility, we should be able to charge for a lot of this public transport, many of these issues, for car use, be it through fuel taxes or congestion charging or any means. It's, it's an interesting funding source in order to subsidize better and cheaper public transport. But also, I just like to say one last thing, since it has to do with conflict, political conflict. Because the lowest possible, since we are in Embark and all this, the lowest cost systems are basically uh, surface systems, BRT system. This is what we have been fighting about, bicycles. And this implies huge political fights. And it's very interesting how uh, some people who are even very leftist, uh, when it comes to taking space away from their cars, that's as far as their leftism goes. Uh, I was in San Francisco recently working in, on a BRT lane they're doing there. And San Francisco, of course, is always super cool, super uh, progressive and, and all this. But when it came to take away some parked cars along where the BRT was going to, ah, no. That, we are not that progressive, that much. I mean, we are ready to pay. I think in Bogota, at least, just to finish, at least I think one great thing that we have achieved in Bogota is that collectively, culturally, culturally, everybody, rich or poor, today agrees that the logical, obvious thing to do in any road is to put exclusive lanes for buses. Nobody complains. Nobody. I mean, nobody is so... Even if they complain in private, they would be ashamed to complain in public. This is at least some cultural achievement we have had, that at least everybody agrees on this. Right. Thank you. Mary Jane, final comment on this or anything else? Just your well, last chance. Uh, I come from a developing city, and one of the things that was told to me by a UN Habitat official, he was Chinese, and he told me, Mary Jane, I want you to look at the way China did it. They borrowed money from whoever wanted to lend them money. So they borrowed, but if you use that money wisely, they were able to get it back in a shorter period of time when they should have paid it in 15 years with five years moratorium, and that money they used. So I followed that advice. I borrowed from the World Bank for our landfill. I borrowed for our, uh, our drainage canals. I borrowed for added classroom buildings, even if it's the mandate of national government. And I'd like to say that we were able to pay it 
even less than 20 years. And so we were able to get the benefits at a lower cost. So as long so, as, number one, there is no corruption. Right. So borrowing is good as long as one spends the money well. And by the way, in this room, there are some big financiers and small financiers. I see our friends from CAFA here, the vice president. So if you want a really effective loan, go to them. I think various other multilateral banks are here as well. <laughs> um, and so that's good. Also, um, and maybe, uh, uh, Tony, you want to come up here now. Um, let me also say on the, on the financing side, to thank very much uh, those who are here who make the kind of analytical work and the technical assistance work uh, so possible. So here we have SIF, uh, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, got Bloomberg Philanthropies, we've got the Shell Foundation, we've got the FedEx Foundation, and several others. And these are really making a huge difference, um, enabling organizations like ours to make a real difference. Um, so, Tony, tell us, what did you hear? Well, ah, in Portuguese. Yes. <laughs> um, Muitas coisas, seguramente. Impossível fazer um sumário de tudo que foi falado aqui. Então, até por uma questão de respeito ao público e ao tempo, que agora é, nos resta pouco, eu vou uh, simplesmente falar algumas coisas. Também me disseram para falar mais devagar, até por questões de possibilitar traduzir. Então, vai ser um pouco mais lento. Primeira grande lição, que eu acho que vocês todos ouviram, todas as cidades podem, sejam elas pequenas ou grandes, mais ou menos ricas. É, acho que um grande ponto tocado aqui, e que a gente tem falado muito, e, e isso é fruto até do nosso trabalho, é, a questão da visão. É, nós aqui trabalhamos com muitas cidades, e uma das primeiras perguntas que a gente faz quando chega em algum lugar é qual a visão da cidade? Poucas são as cidades no Brasil que têm uma visão desenvolvida. E eu acho que foi muito oportuno no debate se começar falando, e o Andrew puxou o assunto da, da visão. Eu tentei juntar o que seria uma visão a partir das, da coletânea de, de coisas que, que foi falado, e me parece assim, uma cidade mais equânime, há um certo consenso sobre isso, saudável, que faça melhor uso do seu espaço público, e aí para prosperar com felicidade. Quer dizer, nós estamos basicamente falando sobre isso, se a gente juntar o que aqui foi dito. O importante na visão é também que ela precisa transcender governos. Nós estamos falando aqui, como o Henrique falou, de lugares que têm três anos como tempo de mandato, e isso é pouco tempo. Então, ela precisa ser é, construída pelos principais atores da cidade. De outra forma, ela não vai transcender um mandato político. Às vezes, tem que se esperar que o prefeito seja reeleito para daí, então, ele poder tocar em frente. Isso não seria a situação ideal. É, dessa visão da cidade é que deve ser desdobradas, então, todas as demais estratégias, como, por exemplo, a estratégia da mobilidade. Ela tem que estar ligada a isso. Eu consigo, pelo menos, pensar, e eu acho que vocês também, numa estratégia de mobilidade a partir dessa expressão de visão de cidade que eu formulei aqui no início. Na questão da administração, me pareceu muito interessante a, a paixão e o amor. Né? Foram palavras que apareceram aqui. Acho que todos vocês são grandes líderes, são pessoas que tiveram muito sucesso nas suas cidades e, portanto, fizeram muito bom uso disso souberam motivar suas equipes. Né? E uh, foi muito bem levantado pelo Henrique a questão de suportar a dor. É, é importante isso, né? porque os momentos ruins vão ocorrer. Né? E essa equipe toda precisa estar muito uh, motivada, e ela precisa, inclusive, trabalhar 24 horas. Alguns até falaram em mais horas por dia. Né? Então, é uma dedicação absolutamente plena de pessoas que efetivamente gostem de trabalhar e que sejam também muito é, competentes. É, isso realmente é algo importante. Né? Nem todas as cidades vão ter essas equipes já formadas e é muito importante, então, é, montar esses, esses times. Né? E na negociação, ó, algo que o Jaime colocou, que me pareceu muito interessante, saber é, o que é de fato ceder. Nem tudo vai ser possível alcançar. Nunca ceder o essencial, mas colocar, obviamente, algumas coisas e imaginar que algumas delas eh, não poderão ser avançadas. 
das perguntas, como a pergunta que o Vinícius fez sobre a questão da restrição do carro, esse talvez seja um dos pontos mais duros, pelo menos na realidade brasileira. Só lembrando vocês, nós temos hoje no Brasil uma mobilidade nas cidades, nas grandes e médias cidades, e que, uma, não diria mobilidade, a taxa de motorização dessas médias e grandes cidades é equivalente à, à da Europa em meados dos anos 80. Bem, quem conhecia ou sabia o que tinha na Europa em meados dos anos 80, seguramente um sistema de transportes coletivo muito melhor do que nós temos hoje no Brasil. Nem todas as cidades na Europa já conseguiram avançar ao ponto que o Leviston colocou aqui, de fazer a, a taxação do congestionamento. Ou, como alguns economistas querem chamar agora, a taxação do ganho do tempo, que talvez seja algo muito mais interessante para ser colocado, do que chamar, como chamaram no Brasil, pedágio urbano, que é a forma mais, talvez, desqualificada de colocar algo que dá um retorno econômico para as, para as pessoas. Bem, uh, talvez isso seja muito duro tocar no momento, mas é um tema que, uh, mais para frente, uma vez que a gente tem aí um sistema de transportes uh, mais, com mais produtividade e, e mais qualificado. É muito importante essa troca de experiências. A gente fala muito no nosso trabalho aqui no Brasil da tropicalização das coisas. Nós não queremos simplesmente trazer experiências de outros lugares para cá. E o Armit relacionou aqui, e muito bem levantado pelo, pelo Andrew, é, que o que fizeram na Índia foi inspirado no que aconteceu na Colômbia. Né? E isso atingiu lá 36 cidades, e é uma coisa espetacular, é matéria do The Economist. Então, isso é o que uma rede como a Embarque proporciona, essa troca de experiências. A gente aprende muito. Os problemas que nós estamos vendo no Minha Casa Minha Vida, por exemplo, no Brasil, são muito similares ao que acontece também no México. Né? E assim vai. Quer dizer, as coisas são, às vezes, parecidas. Não necessariamente as soluções serão as mesmas. Mas o que alguns centros em alguns países fazem podem ser adaptados ou tropicalizados em, em outros contextos. Sobre a questão do clima, e, bem, eu acho que aí o importante é medir. Né? Nós precisamos começar a medir para entender, de fato, o que, que nós estamos é, é, gerando de emissões nas, nas cidades. Esse é um desafio, né? é um desafio mundial. Pelo que nós vimos do SEM, é um grande desafio também para as cidades americanas. Eu acho que é da ordem de 1% das cidades americanas que tem as, as emissões avaliadas. Uh, temos já um protocolo comum acordado, ok? Isso é uma boa base, isso nos permite, então, inclusive, fazer um benchmarking aí, comparar as, as cidades, né? e, mas o importante é, é começar a fazer isso. E eu encerraria com palavras que a gente ouve muito lá do, do prefeito Blumer, eu nunca ouvi dele diretamente, mas muito da equipe dele, né? que em Deus a gente acredita e o resto que traga os dados. Né? Parece ser um, um bom. Um bom ponto.